Welcome, everybody. Uh, Chad, good to see you. I had to give a call out to that young man. Um, well, we're, we're dealing with the two most boring topics in the entire world today, uh, technology and insurance. So hopefully we can keep everybody awake and alive. Um, but this is the uh, space that Mark and I live in. Uh, we've had lots of clients this summer uh, really spend an enormous amount of time uh, digging in past just cyber uh, risks, but actually getting into the insuring of the risk. And what we've seen really is an industry that uh, woke up this summer and really started to dig into the risks of which they <clears throat> were insuring. So a lot of this is going to be about what we've seen from the insurance world, what we've seen uh, ransomware doing to the insurance world and how they actually are underwriting the risk and what our business owners have seen. Mark, you want to toss anything in on that? Sure. I, and I think the numbers and what they're facing as an underwriter, uh, underwriters have, have gotten even worse. Uh, I posted a link to the chat, um, but recent report just from a few days ago kind of summarized the situation. Um, they thought it was bad in 2020 uh, when they had $416 million in uh and even just the ransomware payments that they couldn't see that, uh, that may or may not have been going through insurance. Uh, and now in the first half of 2021, we're looking at over $590 million in, in ransomware payments. And so you've, we're kind of seeing you know, a lot of this being driven by, by ransomware itself. Um, there's other issues that are creeping in as well, but you know, I think that's you know, one of the big pain points for insurers and that'll kind of underlie some of the motivations you see us talking about here too. So we'll run through the slideshow, but we really do want to uh, be as interactive as we can. Um, we've given this a few times live, uh, so people have jumped in a little bit more when we're live. So please post questions. Uh, we're wildly interested. Uh, Mark and I meet with clients every week. We've been getting applications from insurers every, every day for our clients. And it has been amazing to watch the evolution of what we call the application uh, from, our, from our insurers, which has really been driving a lot of our clients to, to actually go further than they've gone in their management of their cyber risk. So it's been an interesting year so far. So we'll, we'll keep moving and uh, see where we go. Mark, you want to go ahead? Sure. You know, and I, as ransomware has kind of become, you know, uh, really a scourge. And also we had the, at the same time, we've had, you know, privacy laws become more stringent and the penalties for potential breaches there uh, increase. So we've seen a lot of potential increase uh, in coverage. Uh, people, you know, look, we see uh, up 26% in just 2016, um, and then um, up to 47% of businesses now, you know, in the 2020, opting for some sort of, of cyber coverage. And from, we, we believe a lot of the decision-making is so that it can offset some of the costs of, of an anticipated cyber attack. And indeed, that's kind of been a lot of the change in thinking too. It's not a matter of, you know, if you get compromised or, or breached at some point, it's just a matter of time. Um, and particularly if you don't have a lot of, you know, kind of controls in place to help to know when something is happening and know when you've been breached and limit that damage, you know, there's going to be, you know, mostly what you're looking at is trying to figure out what is the degree of loss I'm going to entertain. And for a while, insurers let you uh, and a lot of their insureds basically treat the policy as if it, were, if it were entirely how to respond, you know, for incident response purposes. So any breach, they assume the policy would cover entirely. And with that, the insurers were not particularly enforceful about all the, the presumed security and cybersecurity controls that should have been in place. And, and so now the, the basically starting in 2019 and then into really into 2020, the attacks just got so much more severe. The cyber criminals use the money from their early successes to start leapfrogging and you know even investing more into better and better ways to uh, attack and and just become more efficient at overall at what they were doing. Uh, and so insurers have started to see all these claims really rise up and uh, it took them a little bit to realize how that, that this was going to not stop, that this was going to be a hockey stick of, 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 of losses for them. And so they actually started uh, trying to underwrite less. Um, that article also that I posted also includes a note from Lloyd's that they may or may not have told a lot of their syndicate uh, underwriters to really almost stop writing cyber insurance altogether. 
And so what's happening is you've got a diminishing, kind of a shrinking market at the moment of suppliers. You do have a number of insurers who haven't been in the market before now rushing in and saying, we've got to, we can fill in this, you know, and meet this demand. And because there's money here to be made. And so there, and so there's some, there is some turmoil going on. You got a lot of turnover and a lot of folks are seeing their renewals, uh, their carriers not wanting to renew with them, but other carriers are coming in and now enforcing much more stringent standards and, and deeper questions. Um, but along the way, most folks are ending up seeing these premiums skyrocket. And so on average, you probably see 30 to 50%. Uh, and you know, if you're renewing now or you know, for the next year, uh, I would at least expect that. You might, we've had um, somebody renew a couple months ago uh, who had pretty good coverage, say $5 million. And to renew with their existing carrier, it was basically going to be three times the premium, and uh, and they got a competitive offer from a new company coming in, a new underwriter who gave them the same numerical coverage, and and was only about thirty or forty percent higher than original. Um, but there was a lot of caveats in there, a lot of individual like sublimits and other particular aspects of breach uh, expenses that weren't covered. And they declined, they actually just said, for this year, we're going to pay the, the extra premium and, and just have continuity in our coverage. Uh, and, and that was their kind of way to manage that risk. But not everybody's going to be able to do that. And so you want to be ready to look, put on as, as good a face as possible, uh, look strong and look like you're secure. And that actually does make a difference with the underwriting. They're not, they're, they're looking you know, they're looking to see who is going to be a potential source of a claim for them. As we said, we've seen these reduced limits crop in. So, you know, for a breach notification, those expenses used to be, you know, maybe, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars, and they're starting to push those down. Um, they're starting to anticipate that, you know, the, that with ransomware, there's going to be certain kinds of other expenses for recovery um, and kind of business uh, continuity losses. And they're starting to, re, you know, they're starting to basically come up with, you know, lower limits for those. Um, and you're also going to see a lot more exclusion. Certain kinds of, of you know, if uh, activities just won't be covered. Um, if you don't, if you somehow, if your security controls that you answered, you know, positively to on an application uh, turn out to have not been as effective as you said they were, uh, you know, your claim is probably going to be excluded. Um, and they'll be very aggressive about that moving forward. And it comes down to some very technical ticky tack things like, you know, you had one interface, you know, one remote access method that didn't have two factor multi factor authentication on it. Well, you know, either we're not going to underwrite you or uh, at all, or we're going to, you know, have that as an exclusion and say, you know, if you can't prove that, you know, the breach didn't happen through that particular area. Uh, you know, nothing's going to be, you know, your, your claim is going to be denied, basically. Um, and so all putting that all together, they end up with these increasingly complex questionnaires. And those questionnaires really try to get at five different general aspects uh, of, of, of what risk you might present to them. Um, firstly, the, they want to know that you have a security program in place. It doesn't need to be one that a Fortune 500 company would be running but it needs to have some, some common elements that indicate you, you're paying attention to what's going on. You're helping your, your people be, uh, you know, give guidance on, on how they need to behave and, and, uh, and how they need to run a program. Um, secondly here, they, they do wanna know what you look like from the outside. So they will engage in, in basically some open source intelligence on you. They'll go out and figure out what do you look like from the outside? Uh, they don't need permission to figure that out. Most of that data is out there. And they'll start to figure out things like, hey, are these people, are the employees always showing up in breaches? And then are they always showing up in different breaches with the same password? Uh, that will get you a pretty big red flag and your, you know, your, your premium is going to go up. And you'll have to, you know, unless you have a policy that backs that up and, and says, or kind of backs up the risk there and says, we actually, you know, now force everybody to have unique passwords, at least by policy. Uh, thirdly, you want to give your, your staff the right tools uh, to not be the inside risk that you know they're worried about as well. So that can be an intentional or unintentional. You know, unintentionally, almost there's almost no reason to think your employees are going to intentionally uh, harm you. But you know, they're just trying to do their job. And sometimes, you know, if you know someone may send them a malicious email, a fish, 
And if it has, you know, the, if it's the wrong kind of fish, you could have a ransomware attack fairly quickly afterwards, unless there's a lot of other controls around them. But the number one thing is to help them prevent, lower the likelihood of them clicking that link in the first place. They know you can't eliminate it, but they want you to, they want to understand how, what you're doing to lower that risk. And then if something does happen and when it does happen, uh, do you have a plan for how to respond to it? It's called an incident response plan. And it's, it can be pretty uh, easy to become stale if it's just in writing and you never try it. So they want to have some evidence that you've been testing your recovery plans, uh, your incident response plan, and, and you understand you know, what you can and can't do when, you know, when an attack happens. And then finally, they want to kind of see how the rubber meets the road. If they've had a, if there's been a recent uh, high profile attack or vulnerability, they want, they may give you a questionnaire that's just dedicated to that and help want you to explain what you did to respond to it, whether or not you were able to detect that you were compromised or breached. Um, and as it says here, the example that we all think about is in March, there was an, an attack against uh, Microsoft Exchange servers for anybody who operates there on premises. And uh, it was one of those really bad ones where the attack had already been going on before anybody knew about it. It's called a, uh, it's called a zero day, but it was a lot more widespread than that. Um, they tried to keep the information quiet until they were ready to patch and it kind of didn't happen in the right sequence. And so things kind of got all, you know, all very, uh, you know, very, very, uh, every live all at once. We started having, as soon as we got the bulletin, we almost immediately found servers didn't compromise. Um, and some of them had been compromised, you know, for a few weeks. And, and so it would create, it created kind of a really a mass, uh, a mass recovery event. And they want to understand that you have the processes in place that can kind of, uh, that were able at that time to respond to that and limit your risk from that. So. so if anybody wants to post any questions at this time, so really we're going to break down these five areas that they really are looking at. We're going to look at some policies and procedures that should be in place, and we're going to look at some actual applications and application questions. Uh, a year ago, we saw nothing like this from the insurance carriers. They're, they're really, unless you were an extremely large company, Maybe in the financial industry, did we see any sort of insurance questions in cyber uh, that got anywhere near this? But today we are seeing, like Mark said, they want to know what your policies and procedures are. They want to know what you're doing with your end users. They want to know if you have uh, password policies in place. They want to know where there's multi-factor uh, in a lot of places. They want to actually dig into your network. We've had many companies that... Uh, the, their insurer has hired an outside company. They've already run a network test against them and they've sent scores to them. We have clients who are being forced to participate with some of these third parties and they have to have a score above a certain mark or they won't keep their insurance policy. Um, the problem with many of these are, uh, like a, one of our clients who's a, a, a law firm here in town, um, half the stuff that this outside firm was hitting wasn't even had anything to do with their firm. So you really have to be proactive. You really have to now start having a security program, like Mark said, and you've got to know what you're talking about when you send these questionnaires back. Uh, over the last five or 10 years, we've had clients fill out these, send them back. They realize they filled them out wrong. And then we get to jump in, do an audit with the uh, insurer. Today, if you fill these out wrong, you either get a 75% increase or some people just get dropped uh, because they don't want to underwrite the risk. So what Mark is talking about, very real and uh, a little scary as a business owner, if this is something you pass down to your IT provider, if it's something that maybe you had other people participate in in the past, uh, a lot of us business owners like to fly fast and not participate with these things. Uh, this is clearly one of those uh, areas that I think any business owner now uh, is going to want to participate in and know what's going on. So answering the questions, this is a big area that we've expanded. Most of our clients now, we've kind of uh, 
how can I say we've uh, hypnotized them to just send us the questionnaire first, let us answer truthfully about their network. And like I like to tell all of our clients, we're going to answer truthfully, but then there should kind of be another column that says, okay, if you want us to answer yes on this, here's what the cost is going to be. This is the new policy. This is the new thing that you should be looking at. So as you're thinking about answering questions, I think that that's a really good way that most of us, especially in the small and medium market, need to think about. Most people can't answer yes to everything. But making sure that those who interact with your IT can then tell you, okay, this is no now, but here's the project, here's the scope, and here's the cost. Um, and on many of these, I have found that if we answer yes and we actually implement it, it you, it'll be less than the premium increase you would have seen in the first year. Um, so I think that that's a really good way most should be looking at many of these. Um, Mark, I don't know how we want to drill in. Yeah, I mean, I think these are just kind of a visual representation of what the application looks like. This is a lot more dense and a lot more specific than, as Jim said, any applications we've seen before. You know, they used to just be like, you know, seven or eight questions and say, you know, it'd be very general and you almost couldn't make out what they were asking about. Um, and, and now they're now they're getting so specific, you almost don't know what they're talking about because it's it's almost a specific to certain technologies too. So uh, kind of whipping around the other direction um, and it's also a first year for these applications. And so sometimes there's actually questions that they haven't vetted enough um, and they don't make a lot of sense in the environment. Um, well, you know, we try to come up with, with uh, you know, most likely answers to those um, and certainly ones that kind of get beyond or address the risk that the question is trying to get at. Usually that's pretty easy to figure out. And so that's, you know, with your insurer, you kind of want to, you know, when it's ever ambiguous, you want to go with, with the spirit of what they're always after, which is, is, which is mitigating their risk um, and have basically understanding how you're mitigating your risk too. So um, some of the questions, yeah, they're varying in scope and depth. Um, we have seen a client who just went on on their loan, on their loan, on their lonesome, and they didn't really, um, you know, and some of the answers they gave were, were not great. And so the insurer caught on to that and their premium went up $75,000 in one year. Uh, and now we're in the process of helping them try to figure out how to, how to look better for the next renewal period, which that's process is starting immediately because there was enough things to grow on that, you know, we're going to make changes for, for months to try to not try to spread out the cost over the entire year as well. Um, as Jim mentioned too, sometimes your insurer uh, decides to help you by giving you a lot of information or at least access to the information that they're using to judge you on the IT side. And so this report from Covis came from a, uh, a client of ours and you can see all their scores are really good, except in the, in the lower left, in the lower right there, you have uh, a 14 show up. Um, that's kind of a bad score. <laughs> and it's really, in this case, it's actually because uh, it was some of, their, some of their clients were affiliated who you know, they helped out. Um, that were basically rolled into their risk assessment and the clients were completely insecure and definitely have, you know, some problems. Um, but now we kind of have to go back and, and say your open source intelligence program is, it's got, you know, we've got to, we've got to figure out how to correct this and fix things from there. Um, and Corvus in particular seems to have a, some mature uh, things going on. They're still not necessarily, they're not really on your side, right? They, they, they're, you know, there's still kind of a, some tension there and you want to be able to just show them that you're actually doing things um, and, you, you know, and, and, uh, and do whatever you can to lower your, lower your premium with them the next year. Um, but number one, they'll ask about your information security program. They want to know that it's written or at least certain key element, elements that are going to be written. Um, patching. Patching is still one of the, one of the many easiest ways that an attacker will start to be able to move around the network once they've made that initial landing after getting through with say like a fish, they fish somebody got a link, downloaded a little program and that program just started, found all these unpatched machines and that's what they're looking for. Do you want, they wanna make sure that you're applying updates centrally to be an automated system and everybody's getting them applied on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, forcing reboots. And if it's a security critical kind of security patch, they want to make sure you can push it out right away. With your backups, they want to know that you have these uh, that you have full backups on a regular basis, and then you're also getting these incrementals that are at least targeting all the critical areas where your data sits. Um, that those incrementals need to be happening daily, 
ideally, uh, you know, they'll, you'll see that and not, and see maybe a full backup every one to two weeks, depending on your backup system. Now I know you can get the data back too. Um, with firewalls, they want to see them. They're both in the, they're, they're in the right places in the network. Um, but also that they're down, you know, activated on the endpoints as well. There's software firewalls on, on workstations. Those should be getting used too. They're really looking for this layering effect so that no single failure is going to be the only hope you had of, of stopping a particular kind of attack. Now, we've seen a shift recently. So the long, you know, IDS or intrusion detection system, that's a long time technology that we've seen mostly on the network side. There's been solutions that have worked on the workstation side too. Those are called host-based IDS. Um, and those have kind of gone through an upgrade process in the last couple of years to something called EDR and endpoint, endpoint detection and response. It's basically not even necessarily like supercharged antivirus. It's, it's, uh, it's more like, artificial intelligence antivirus. And so it kind of creates this new space where it can understand when, when a workstation has been compromised and start to alert a central monitoring facility and saying, hey, I've done everything I can to mediate this, mitigate this, this risk. You need to intervene now. I've kind of shut the machine off the network. It really takes this proactive action and, and, and gets the system as much as it can out of your network and not able to attack you anymore. <laughs> IDS does the same thing, but on internet-facing connections. With email security, uh, you're seeing kind of a new level of interest there in, in how email can be filtered for viruses. Um, you know, is your, you know, is your web traffic also getting filtered? What technologies are you using there? Uh, so we've seen there's web filtering now you can do on the endpoint as well. Similar, you know, kind of sometimes it fits within the your EDR system, um, but you may have a standalone uh, program like Umbrella, which basically looks at all the addresses in the internet your user is going out to and selectively blocks those if they look like they're risky. Um, and uh, and they definitely want to make sure your data is getting encrypted both while it's sitting anywhere and then while it's moving anywhere. So we call it data at rest and data in transit. And then particularly because a lot of, so much is done now on mobile devices, you know, your basically your mobile device, your average phone keeps a copy of, you know, lots of sensitive emails. And they wanna make sure that you have a way to verify that full disk encryption or all the encryption that can be turned on on those phones and tablets, that that's happening as well. And finally, from the outside, or not finally, but uh, again, multi-factor authentication any way you can get in from the outside, uh, they wanna have that, but also for any kind of administrative access, they wanna make sure that both internally and externally, there's multi-factor as well. And so this is one that's kind of a little bit different twist than what we've uh, seen in the past. They wanna make sure that even if you're in the network, if you're in a part of the network where you had to actually physically be in the office, you still need to be able to use multi-factor authentication to get into your domain controller or into your backup system uh, or into that really critical server. If you're an Apple user, you clearly have, have noticed the world of multi-factor. I don't think you can even do anything anymore without eight steps before you can do something. If you all remember two years ago, you could probably two-click into every purchase. Today, it's almost like you've got to multi-factor everything. So you're going to see multi-factor grow more and more and more to a point where you have to use it inside the network as well. I think this is one of the areas Mark and I were mo most shocked. Uh, the insurers seem to grab onto this very quickly during this last six months. They never asked this question a year ago. I, I don't think I've ever seen it on an application before this last year, and now they want it everywhere. So uh, they clearly are afraid of three big areas, which is you got to have policies and procedures. Your end users are your biggest, biggest way in, and you better patch everything. And I think that multi-factor is growing very closely into being the fourth. So, yeah. And then they want to know too, that you know how to actually limit your risk. And the best way to do that is to destroy any data you don't actually need. And so when your equipment is end of life and it gets retired, does it just sit on, a, on the shelf or does it, you know, or do you have somebody come in and destroy it in a shredder and certify that it got destroyed? Same with hard drives that come out of equipment. But they're also starting to look at 
the data itself. So if you're storing data in, you know, on a server or in the cloud and, and the, you know, and say it's a client engagement or, a th you know, a stakeholder you've, you've been managing and, and working with, and you have a lot of uh, confidential information and, you know, and, and that engagements finally come to a natural conclusion, how long do you keep that data? They want to know that you know when, the, when it can be deleted um, because if there is anything sensitive in there that stays sensitive on an ongoing basis, it's still a risk to you and potentially for them in terms of a claim. So monitoring user accounts, uh, they want to know both that you're able to identify anybody who is in your network, but also if an account has been created for something or some purpose, uh, that it doesn't just sit there and do nothing waiting to get picked up or picked off by an attack. Uh, whenever you get something new from a vendor or from a manufacturer, do you go through the default settings and make sure that any security options that can be enabled are enabled? A lot of times you end up with default usernames and, and passwords in some of these systems and, uh, and they'll definitely, you know, and an audit would definitely test for that. They wanna make sure that you do that on your own and don't wait for an audit to come around to do it. Physical security controls are kind of an interesting one as well, uh, especially now that we're virtual. So this one is probably a little bit less intense than it would have been if there hadn't been a pandemic. And, but they wanna make sure that, you know, around any office or anywhere where you store your data, that you have certain kinds of physical controls that will help you make sure that only authorized personnel are coming in. And if there's a, say a server closet, then only those only additionally authorized service personnel or even narrower group than that one that can get into the office can get into that server room. They like seeing servers in a data center if you want to do that way, or if there's, if you have a cloud provider uh, like Atomic, that they have uh, suitable certifications in place to know that all the physical security controls that protect their systems are in place. So Atomic, we have a SOC 2 Type 2 and a SOC 3 certification. Uh, there's, they're, they're pretty difficult to maintain. And, uh, and so it's often easier just to outsource that kind of function and data storage as well. Now, along the way, they want you to put up some, some guardrails. And those guardrails sound a lot like policies and procedures if you read between the lines. You have a formal process for backing up archiving, restoring, and, and segregating sensitive data. And again, it's, you know, they want to just know that you can compartmentalize and not everything's going to get, you know, and not, just one breach is not going to lead to, you know, your backups being destroyed as well. Um, for mobile device usage, do users know what they're, how they're supposed to use it? Do, do the administrators know that they need to enforce having, you know, a, you know, a six character or an eight character pin on a mobile device and that they need to make sure encryption gets enabled on those devices. And also that remote wipe is gonna be available if in case the device is lost or, or compromised. For working from home, users need to know that when they work at home, they're, you know, they're still kind of, uh, you know, the security policies still apply. There's not, just because they're, they haven't brought their machine or laptop into the office and in over a year, doesn't mean they can start in installing, you know, all these applications they would normally run on a home computer. Um, also, and I think that's actually been one of the underwriters' risks as well. They think they've seen a lot of the rise in ransomware claims come from situations that were that started at computers from people working at home who weren't normally at home. Uh, also, need policies and procedures for reviewing your vendors and figuring out how are they secure. Do they have a good security posture? Uh, you know, and that's that's just something that you should, you know at least once a year, you should be talking to any vendor and saying, what are y'all doing to make sure that, you know, anything that we trust you for, that that's trust is, is earned and maintained. Normally too, they wanna have, they wanna see somebody inside your organization be accountable for being the kind of the, the go-to person for uh, being the advocate and the, and the safeguard of information security overall. They don't need to be an expert at it, but they, they need to have some ability to you know, drive the message and work with third-party vendors to secure areas that they, you, know, you don't wanna handle internally. Um, sometimes regulations actually require it, and you may see that more happening as well as we see privacy regulations in the US start to take off. Um, under in Europe, you all you need a chief privacy officer, and I think in California, you 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 already need that essentially as well. Or and you may need a chief information security officer as well under in certain jurisdictions now already as well. And so, kind of what I mentioned earlier is they not only do you want to know that everybody on your network is supposed to be there, you want to know who they are. 
So um, they want to know, and, and if they've been authorized with the right amount of access. And so not everybody needs to be an administrator of their local machine. And that's, uh, you know, that is a primary um, exponent to an attack becoming something really bad is when, you know, if a user who is also be, can be administer their computer, if they get compromised through, you know, a fish or a web browser, suddenly, you know, that attacker now can really own that local their, their local workstation, and they can use that as a really powerful lever to take over other parts of the network from there. And uh, give a vulnerability management process. What that means is you have a way of understanding what vulnerabilities exist in your environment, documenting them, setting up a, a expected time for those vulnerabilities to be fixed or remediated. And you know, if you know you can't reach those, those, uh, those timelines, you need to turn it into a risk assessment where you kind of say, what's my real risk here? What's my likelihood of anything bad happening? Are there any smaller steps I can take to make that risk manageable or prevent it from happening in a, in a reasonable way, even though I can't eliminate it completely? And when you're sharing data with a third party, uh, what do you do to make sure that they have act, you know, all the same controls that are expected of you in place as well? Normally, in a, in a lot of these you know, privacy regimes, those, any, anything that is applying to you as for how you need to maintain personal data from somebody else, that's going to automatically apply to any person or, or party you share that data with as well. And it's your responsibility to make sure that they are doing that as well. And it just makes good sense too, you know, just because, uh, you know, some of your constituents or stakeholders gave you their personal information, you know, if they won't really give you a break because, because you loaned it to somebody who happened to not be very secure. So one of those guardrails we want to put up too is just understanding the scope of all the different services that you use. Um, most organizations, even before the cloud, had a lot of applications internally, and they really didn't normally understand how many different things they had running where data could potentially be stored that was you know, either sensitive or had other kind of uh, would be negative consequences if it was if it was uh, disclosed. Um, and now adding in all these different cloud services, they seem to just kind of mushroom. They don't really, they share data a little bit, but they don't shift the responsibility away from you to make sure that, you know, all this data is being stored securely. And so an insurer looks at that and says, I want to make sure that you're managing all of those and, and that, uh, you know, um, that that you've understood the risk and are, you know, have, and if possible or where necessary, you've decided to not use a service potentially or, or use it for only certain kind of uh, sanitized versions of your data. Take away the sensitive part if you can. So this is, uh, this is kind of an example of a, something called a data map that we do for our clients. And um, I think it's a very good idea. I've not seen uh, a lot of our clients understand all the systems that are running. Uh, when you really break down, it, it's a little overwhelming. This, by the way, this is a, less than about 100, maybe 150 people in this company. And these are all the applications that they operate uh, and that they need to keep track of the users who use them. Some of them are in cloud. Some of them are on-prem. Some of them are, uh, uh, utilize laptops, uh, web browsers, uh, handhelds, iPads. Uh, it's quite overwhelming. And it's pretty amazing all the stuff that Mark's kind of going through that companies of all sizes, doesn't matter whether you're 5, 10, 20 per person companies, you've got to have this stuff mapped out so that you understand where your risks are. Um, you know, a lot of times we're trying to help people not go overboard because clearly everyone can act like a, you know, Fortune 500 company with 100 people in a department. But uh, I had to go through all this with a seven person company the other day to help them get their premium down from, I think, 10,000 a year to five because they answered their questions wrong uh, on their application. So I, I think that it is kind of time for IT to take a, a seat at the table, if you will, when it comes to risk management, a lot more than it has in the past. Uh, and this all seems, I think, very overwhelming for small companies to have to manage. So it is something you have to start getting a grip on because um, we're seeing it it's coming. And a lot of smaller companies have to have these insurance policies in place for their large clients who, who really make it 
uh, mandatory by their contracts. So it's it's getting interesting, as I like to say. It is. So we also want to be able to avoid that insider risk. And a lot of that's going to be solved by just training your users to be to understand the basics of security. Um, you want to have a formal documented and measured uh, employee security awareness program. And by measured, we mean that not only, you know, you give it to them at least annually, but then you're testing them somehow, you know, that you can give them a seminar or a slide deck, but you need to be, make sure that they're retaining some of that information and particularly, and hopefully be some information that would be, you know, specific to your company, but general security practices and, and best practices are a great thing to train on. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of different ways to, to present that information in a, in a digestible way and just making it a regular part of your company's activities uh, is going to be, uh, you know, seen very positively by a potential insurer. Refining on that, even more frequently, you want to actually uh, actively train your users that what a, on what phishing email looks like. It changes quite a lot. And so if you just train somebody every year, they might not, you know, be ready for the, you know, the changes in the, you know, in the, in the way attackers are shaping emails to lure them into clicking something that, uh, you know, a link to a malicious site. And so we really recommend anywhere from monthly to quarterly. And that's mostly what your insurer is looking for too. Although they normally in the multiple choice questions, they'll, they'll let you say up to annually. Um, if you cross over into never, you're definitely going to get the, you know, kind of like the, the maximum negative scoring possible if, you know, if you think about it that way. Uh, and, and, and phishing is so common. It is, it is probably the number one way that an attack starts still. It has been for several years now, and it's only gotten worse during pandemic when people are you know, separated from each other. They're not fully socialized. And, and so, you know, a really well-constructed email that empathizes with them can really draw them in pretty easily unless they're trained and, and alert to what's coming for them. Uh, and also your employees themselves, their status can change over time. You want to know and keep track of, you know, do they have any risk that you don't know about uh, developing on the back end? And the one number one way to do that is with a background check. We recommend doing that at least at hire. And a lot of times an insurer is going to ask you about doing that on an, on an annual basis as well. And you want to do a pretty good scope on that. You want to give it the full uh, kind of nationwide criminal background check, uh, include uh, sex offender and potentially uh, credit check status too. And there may be policy reasons why you can't do that last part, but that does show up on the, on the questionnaire. Um, and so you may have a chance to talk with your underwriter when that, if that is a particular requirement for them uh, as well. So sometimes you have employees and, uh, and, and outsiders and everybody's, you know, lots of people who need access to your network and to your systems. And again, they want to know that you understand uh, who they are individually, that they've been granted individual accounts that have their own passwords that aren't reused and, and they only have the, the least necessary privileges that they need to get the job done that you're asking them to do. And, and that's the best kind of way to approach them. Um, sometimes we call that a role-based access control system, um, but also in, there's that idea of, of identifying accounts as well. And you know, one step below that would be making sure everybody has those individual accounts with really good passwords and maybe less, maybe you can't say as much about the role-based access or the, the least necessary privileges. And kind of the, the worst answer would be that you don't really have any, you know, use a lot of shared accounts uh, for administrating things uh, or that there's really no uh, complexity requirements uh, or there's, and or there's no expiration requirements. The standards have kind of changed recently. So you can have a really complex password that you can justify not forcing them to change every so often. Um, it's just having a good password policy is, is really essential. And for your users who are going to be remote, um, do you treat them as if they were in the office? Do you give them, you know, are you, are you making sure that the, rem the way they're getting in remotely is as secure as if they were in the office, if not potentially a little bit more? Uh, so you want to basically treat them like they're in a segmented network, uh, as if you would in the office as well. And you can have degrees of that, but the fewer features that you have like that, uh, the more the risk, negative risk scoring is going to go up. And so when users are asking ac accessing critical systems, uh, they want to know that you're uh, requiring multi-factor there as well. 
So users can have access to a file server, but they need to have gone through the two-factor VPN process first. But then if you have an administrator who's getting you know, configuration access to that file server, that administrative connection needs to have two-factor authentication independently from however they got there. And provides a little extra assurance that you know, a compromised account somewhere inside your network isn't getting leveraged uh, to, to start to make uh, data on your file server more accessible so it can get copied outside of the environment. Um, and then one particular question, and whether or not it's really a benefit over the long haul, is on your webmail, the external web interface you use to log into, say, Exchange or, or any email system, is there a two-factor prompt there? And that would also include certainly for the administrative access, but just for regular webmail for Exchange. And uh, uh, so that's, and certainly it's a little bit odd just because you have like desktop clients that may not require that, but certainly webmail is a uh, web, web applications like that are their own kind of risk area that the insurer is trying not ask you too many questions about. And having two factor on your webmail simplifies some of the questions that they would want to go into otherwise. And uh, from an incident response perspective, when something does happen, do you have a business continuity plan? And a kind of a subset of that is a disaster recovery plan. And so the business continuity plan is your overall picture that you have people and roles in place that know that they have certain duties when things go really awry. And so uh, specifically, if you have a disaster where you actually lost the data or you've lost an office, that you're able to relocate and start up new services from a different site. Um, essential to that is that middle one that, uh, I don't know if you want to back up one, Jim, but that you know when you make a backup, that your backup is actually offline. What that means is that you can't use the same, the normal your normal user account to get to the backup system and become an administrator there. The fear and the really real fear is because we've seen it a lot is actually that a compromised account that can be elevated to an administrator for the regular work office environment. If that person can become an administrator in the backup system, the first thing they do before they start a ransomware attack is they'll delete all the backups. And they may not delete every backup, but they'll delete the ones that, you know, that go and maybe go so far back that it would make it incredibly painful for you to have to revert that far back. That's all they need to get done. Uh, and that's what they're trying to, that's what an insurer is interested in making sure you're not doing or you're preventing. Um, and so in the last six months, uh, have you actually tested all of this? And so you kind of go through a dry run. You come up with, uh, you know, with a hypothesis, like what is, what if this happened? And you test that and you, it helps. And you apply, you do that by testing your business continuity plan or your DR plan. And everybody gets together on a weekend. Everybody, all your users know that it's happening. And so you basically say, you know, we're going to have diminished activities for that day because we're going to be in a simulated failover or a simulated attack where we have to fail over. And so it, you've tested it enough. And at least, you know, you need to actually do a technical failover at some point as well. And part of that backup strategy too, is that you do have that offline part, but you also have near line. So you can get back and make, you know, and recover data quickly, even more quickly than doing like a full disaster recovery is that you can restore individual files or things that might've been damaged along the way and lower your time to return to full business operations. One of the big checks that we saw too, kind of come in and get its own questionnaire is, how did you handle a really big security issue that popped up, a publicly disclosed one? And this Microsoft Exchange one from March is gonna continue to have legs for at least another few months or until something worse shows up. Uh, and, and or just something as nearly as bad and, and changes everybody's focus to the most recent uh, really bad uh, situation that happened. And, and so they just wanted you to describe like whether or not you took it seriously as a risk, did your internal risk team, did that, did that key person who had been nominated as your, as your virtual CISO or your security officer, did they talk about that with all the stakeholders and everybody understand the risk and, and kind of document that and be able to know the, how you responded and that you, you know, involved uh, third-party technical resources if you knew it was not going to be able to, you're not going to be able to do it internally. Um, and uh, let's see, you know, they wanted to see the indicators of compromise that you had detected or that you knew that you had been there. And so, as we said earlier, like when we, when that exchange uh, vulnerability got published, we, all, we found servers immediately that already had these indicators or IOCs of compromise uh, sitting on them. And 
they wanted to understand that you knew what tool to use to actually find those as well. That got kind of esoteric. We think there's lots of different ways to do that, but you know, just naming a tool helps them kind of say, okay, that was that sounded like an expert or or somebody who had been informed um, doing what they needed to do. Uh, and when they this one was so bad that they wanted to know if you're service providers, I'll <laughs> also uh, also uh, might have used on-premises exchange. And so they wanted to know if you had gotten a statement, done part of your vendor management due diligence and say, hey, you know, service providers, are any of you using on-premises exchange? And did you do the same things that we've been asked to do by our insurer? So, wow, we made it through that a little more quickly this time, but uh, let's, we can wrap it up. Jim, do you wanna take the, the wrap up or I can keep talking too, so. Yeah, we'll shut you down a little bit, Mark. Okay. Um, thanks, Mark. I mean, to me, if I'm a small business owner, it sounds a little overwhelming if I don't have a staff to do a lot of this. Um, it, it, it is. I, uh, we tell people you got to do it in pieces. Um, I don't think a lot of these things are nearly as hard as they used to be. You clearly can put a lot of these things in place in a very short period of time. Uh, we actually are going to share with you, uh, if anybody wants, we've got like an information security policy uh, in Word that we can share out. Um, there are about 25 different policies that can come off that. Um, they take about maybe 10 hours to go through. Um, and we're happy to engage with anybody on those things. Your IT provider, your IT staff should be engaged in these things. So do know that I think a lot of these tools now can be put in place, put in place pretty quickly. It's just that you got to keep up with them. You generally have to have somebody who's going to track most of this, regardless of the size of your company. So cyber insurance will not get you back into business. It's generally there because you need it for contracts between your relationships. Uh, it's there to help you with you know, uh, it'll cover your legal fees. Sometimes it will cover ransomware. I'm finding that most people need it just to do business, to be quite honest with you. Um, from an IT standpoint, we're actually happy that they're there and trying to help people uh, do the right thing, even though I think they're a little late to the game coming after all these, uh, all these uh, um, insurance uh, costs have come into play is maybe a little late. Uh, when the shit does hit the fan, you need to make sure that uh, you got your stuff covered. You got to know how to talk to your clients and your employees about it. Uh, insurance is probably not going to save you. We know a lot of people that just paid the ransomware, got their data back. Uh, I know a lot of people who have done that. Um, so if you look at the numbers Mark shared, um, it's probably double or triple that because people didn't turn in the insurance claims. And to be honest, I think that the reason we saw the big swing last year is because of the pandemic. People did turn in the insurance claims. So for years, I think people have been paying the 10, 20 grand to get their data back and then kind of cleaning themselves. Uh, if you got ransomware attacked, you know, three years ago, I think it was a dirty thing. I think you just paid, paid it and, and got yourself moving in another direction. I think last year we saw such an increase because people actually didn't, you know, were, they were struggling through the pandemic. So using insurance is a much better thing to do during a downturn year. So keep that in mind. Um, I don't know, Mark, where else you want to go there, but you really need yeah. to start with the basics. You need the information security policy. Right. And it, it kind of looks like this. It basically is a document that you can share out to the public, share with clients, share with prospects, and it outlines all the things you're doing. It's not telling them how you're doing it because you really don't want to share that in public. But it's a document that tells everyone, yes, we have these policies. Yes, we're doing all of these things. And then you kind of can come back and have a policy for each of the things that you say you're doing. And we're going to share that policy out at that email or at that web. Uh, you can go to atomicdata.com backslash ISS and download that Word document. And I think that it's a really good start for those of you who don't have a lot of this covered. And I think from there, you kind of want to just go through. And then as you get to each of these points, you're going to have a separate policy, which then you go into detail about. And that's what you need to train your people on. Um, and this is the policy that you share with the public. 
And then the other policies I clearly wouldn't share with anyone, even if they came in and did an audit, unless you really were compelled to do so. Generally, most insurers and most clients are very happy if they have this policy shared with them. And it kind of outlines what, you, what you're doing. And I think it's a good place to start. Mark, you want to say anything about that? No, nope, I agree. I think um, so it's a couple pages uh, long, and I think that it will really do a lot of good to kind of review that and yet that be your first step if you aren't already on the way there. And I think that is probably enough. There's only about 9 million questions I would ask if I were anybody out there. But if you want to share uh, any of those, please do. Uh, anyone can reach out to Mark and I to talk about these topics. Uh, clearly, insurance has pushed this to the forefront. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's where I will leave things because we're probably almost out of time.